We will smell some. I hope. Thank you very much. Um, first, I mean, you know, this is sort of an automatic, but uh, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank the organizers um, and, uh, and the Institute for, for both A, just organizing this, and B, making the mistake of inviting me. Um, it, it's, a, it's a real honor and a real pleasure, and it's been a lot of fun so far, and, and uh, I hope it will continue to be fun. So thank you. <clears throat> um, I will say a word or two just to tell the, those in the lab who are not uh, familiar with our work a few words about our other aspects of our life in lab, because our lab does a few sort of disparate things. <coughs> Before I'll <coughs> reach the topic that I'll talk about today uh, in length. So, so just to tell you a bit about lab, about life, life in our lab. As you can see, as this is uh, a healthy we'll user. Uh, our, our lab um, does a lot of different things, and, and a lot of it revolves around the fact that we love building stuff. Okay, so we're, we're a group of quite a few engineers in the lab. We like building things. Um, the thing you're seeing here is actually a sniff-controlled wheelchair uh, becoming commercially available this year, we hope. Uh, not the wheelchair, but the sniff controller device. We've developed a method to use sniffing to control any other device. You can control your computer with this. Uh, it works very effectively for uh, significantly disabled individuals, um, and it's just a lot of fun building. Uh, we have a, a whole line coming out of, of sniff control devices, uh, and here you see our, our sniff uh, controlled wheelchair. And, and that's about all I'll be saying about our, our device building uh, world uh, that, that really occupies a, a big part of our life. Um, beyond that, about half of the lab um, is involved in the world of, uh, of social chemo signaling, uh, that is the world of, of interaction between uh, individuals using their sense of smell. Uh, of course, to everybody in the room, it's completely intuitive uh, that there's being information exchanged here between these two mammals. Uh, I have news for you, humans are large mammals, and we all exchange information uh, using similar uh, methods, and so as not to uh, go unupdated on my slides, I updated my slides, uh, and and we we invest a lot of effort. We, the Americans in the crowd, are going crazy. I don't know why. I mean, look, the Europeans have Dominique Strauss Kahn. I mean, he's not as dumb as this guy, but he's way more crazy. <laughs> so, 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 you know, okay. <laughs> Well, at least, you know, at least in the world of chemo signaling, I think he's more crazy, okay? <laughs> and so, 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 um, so, so, and I'll just tell you in one word, which is, which is, is really doing injustice, but in one word of sort of a finding that, that, that uh, came out from our work that sort of is, is a bit of our claim to fame in, in this sub-world of social chemo signaling. Um, in, in rodents, of course, the media that's most studied as a carrier of social chemo signals is urine. Uh, humans do not typically walk around sniffing each other's urine, and, and therefore other uh, uh, media that the body exhume are, are typically studied as carriers of social chemo signaling, most typically sweat. So there's tons of work on potential social chemo signals carried in human sweat. Uh, we, however, hypothesize that there may be other carriers of signals, and, and the one that interests us initially uh, was this liquid here, uh, otherwise known as emotional tears, uh, a liquid uh, we, that the body exerts specifically in highly emotional settings where communication and, and, and often nonverbal communication may be paramount and important. So we hypothesize that this liquid may contain a chemo signal. In fact, we hypothesize that that might be the purpose, uh, the functional purpose of, of crying. Um, and, and through a long set of studies, which I will not detail here in any way, uh, we found that indeed uh, there is some odorless airborne component in this liquid that we have yet to identify uh, that drives distinct patterns of activity in the limbic system, for example, primarily in the hypothalamus, uh, as you see here. And these changes in brain activity have a host of, of, of 
downstream or upstream, depends how you want to look at it, effects, uh, were the most pronounced was a, a marked reduction in, in testosterone uh, in men, and now we've replicated the testosterone effect in women uh, exposed to the airborne molecule, whatever it may be, in emotional tears. So here you see, this is all the data on the unit slope line, but for simplicity, now you can look at the bar graph of the same data. Uh, and this is uh, uh, free testosterone uh, exposed uh, before and after sniffing uh, emotional tears. Um, from conversation with doctors, as far as we understand, this happens to be the fastest and most effective way to lower testosterone that's out there. Uh, it lowers testosterone by about 15% in about 40 minutes. Um, amazingly, this has been replicated independently by others. Uh, so here you have a, a study by a group who I don't even know out of uh, South Korea uh, who, who found a, a, a nearly identical effect in terms of its uh, extent uh, in reductions in testosterone after sniffing emotional tears. And here there's something that, that I like to sort of, I enjoy, I must admit, um, typically in, in, in studying humans, we, we often, especially in chemo signaling, we often go out to see if we can see effects in humans that we know that have existed for a long time uh, in, in rodents, and we see if they exist in humans as well. This is a rare case where th this, this has taken the opposite path. And in fact, after we did this, uh, a very, very similar effect was discovered in mice, where you expose uh, mice uh, to uh, what they're referring to as emotional tears from uh, uh, mice pups, or otherwise known as lacrimal secretions, uh, you have a marked reduction in, in uh, uh, sexual aggression by other male, adult male mice exposed to this uh, 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 liquid. In this case, they also discovered the active compound. Um, so, so a similar effect exists across uh, mammalian species. However, lest we feel too good about ourselves that we discovered something and then it was uh, found in, in mammals. Of course, that's because nobody reads papers anymore. And had we or they looked backwards, we would have all learned that way before us, uh, the exact effect uh, was shown in the blind mole rat, uh, where, where um, in the blind mole rat also, if you take, so, so the blind mole rat emits tears or lacrimal duct secretions. And if you wash this onto another a uh, mole rat, then there's less ag aggression towards that mole rat. So, so the way we like to think now about these emotional tears is, is like a chemical blanket protecting you from aggression of others, okay? So, and, and of course, this raises endless thoughts on, on what does this do, in, you know, why do babies cry and children cry and what does that do to your interaction with them? And, and uh, we're, of course, um, really trying hard to find the active components. Uh, we really hope that it's a component because if it's components, we're hosed, um, and, and uh, we're, we're doing our best to, to try and, and, and push on uh, on this front. I didn't look yet for that peptide. Um, and, and that raises an issue, right, because the peptide is, is non-volatile, although we're, we're desperately trying to find a way where, where somehow the body might make peptides volatile. But... but uh, uh, the peptide would be non-volatile, and the effects we observed were, were uh, by, by a volatile. At least I know that. Um, yeah, OK, I really don't want to park on this for time, but I'll be happy if we have time left to come back, because this was just to tell people a bit about our other sort of existence. And, and sort of pulling us towards the topic of today's talk, we, of course, study olfactory perception. And, and I'll use this opportunity for a quick plug. Uh, Kobe Snitz from our lab is, is starting in, uh, a cross-cultural comparison uh, where we're going to uh, address the question of whether uh, olfactory perception is indeed uh, different across cultures, where our working hypothesis is that it's not. We can, at the end, talk about why we think that in contrast to what is typically uh, uh, thought about this question. Uh, this is the current uh, uh, geographical coverage of labs involved in the project, and we'd really be happy to have more. So uh, if you want to join, especially if you uh, somehow exist in some of these barren areas, uh, then we'd be very happy uh, to have you uh, join the project. OK. Now, what is the question that, that drives the other half of our lab, the half that brings me here and what I'll talk about from here on? So uh, you've, in a way, seen this quote already uh, uh, throughout this meeting and, and um, by none other than, than Alexander Graham Bell. And, and I will actually uh, take the trouble of actually reading through it. So uh, 103 years ago, uh, Alexander Graham Bell said, uh, can you measure the difference between one kind of a smell and another? It's very obvious that we have very many different kinds of smells, all the way from the odor of violets and roses up to asafetida, 
uh, but until you can measure their likenesses and differences, you can have no signs of odor. So, so what is Bell uh, telling us here? And so he went on to study, you know, inferior sensory systems. But, but what what is 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 uh, 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 Bell saying here, or to recapture in other words? And, and this has been shown in various graphics throughout this uh, this meeting. This this notion, whereby the sense of smell is a set of transforms from some sort of physical world of molecules on through some sort of world of neural processing and on to some sort of world of perception, obviously tightly linked to this world of neural processing, but we can think of it as this separate rule. And to date, there is no scientist uh, or perfumer for that matter who, who can uh, uh, consistently look at a novel molecular structure uh, and predict uh, its odor or smell something and predict its molecular perception. Of course, we say no. There, there is no. Of course, there, there are starting to be more and more cracks to this rule of, of, of no. And, and, and the, the most notable current crack is is the one set by by Leslie and, and her group, where they now can in fact predict various uh, 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 perceptual aspects of a molecule uh, uh, by its structure alone. Uh, but this still, and, and I assume you would agree with me with the statement, this still falls short of, of a total ability to look at a mo any molecule and say, oh, that's going to smell like X or like Y. And, and we, no, 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 the study of the sense of smell has, has, has taken an odd path uh, um, in this way, because what's governed our efforts to try and, and, and when I say our, I mean the, the community, what's governed our efforts to try and solve this question is, is the, the, the very profound understanding we first obtained about this level, right? about, about the neural mechanisms or underpinnings of the sensory system. Indeed, a lot thanks to the work of, of, of Linda and, and, and so on and so forth, we have, we have a very deep understanding uh, of what happens here. And, and oddly, this has guided our effort to try and understand what's happening all together. I say oddly because this is very different from the history of other sensory systems. Right? You look at vision. There was first a very deep understanding, a profound understanding of the psychophysics of vision. Take the example of color vision, right? We had Helmholtz who gave us the trichromatic theory and this profound understanding of how you can combine, and this is somewhat uh, 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 giving generalities, but you can mix any three perceivable, uh, you can mix three perceivable lights to obtain any other perceivable color of light. And, and lo and behold, neurobiologists later found three options, right? Where we now know there's a fourth, right? But they weren't looking for four. They were looking for three because they knew that there should be three because of the way the behavior works. Now here, we did not have first the understanding of behavior. And we know that we have you know, roughly 1,000 receptor subtypes. So everybody's saying, wow, this has to be really high dimensional complex because we have 1,000 receptor subtypes. But that's an odd way to approach, in my view, a sensory system, to try and understand the sense by its neurobiology, rather than first understanding the sense and then, and then see how the neurobiology supports this, right? Because it could be those 1,000 receptors, could be 990 of them are doing to something totally different. Um, and, and, and the way I may end up in, in trying to argue that. Um, so we said, OK, let's, let's first look, look at perception. Let's first try and make some, put some order uh, into perception. Um, and, and, and under the notion that what we're aiming to do is to measure perception somehow, uh, measure structure somehow, and measure neural activity in some way, and then link these measures to generate a predict predictive framework, which is in a way what we're all uh, partially after. So how do you measure perception? So we, like many others, uh, uh, relied extensively initially on the work of others done before us, and, and most specifically, uh, Andrew Dravnik's and colleagues uh, who, who published uh, a very helpful data set, um, first in a paper in Science in 1983, and then in the Atlas of Outer, Outer Character Profiles in 85. And to those in the room who are unfamiliar with this, even after the talks we've had in brief, what they did is they sent uh, 138 monomolecular species. It says here 144 because some of them were repeated at different intensities. So they sent 138 monomolecular species by mail to about 150 participants across the United States. These were all smell professionals of one kind or another, many scientists, uh, and had each one of them rate each one of the 138 monomolecules along 146 verbal descriptors. So these are some examples. So you would get, if you were a participant in this, you would get a molecule in the mail, and you would rate it at how lemony it is, and how burnt milk it is, and how wet dog it is, and so on and so forth on a scale uh, from zero to five. So, so on the face of it, uh, you have here 
a uh, 146 dimensional space of odor perception, right? Because there's these 146 dimensions and, and you potentially have this huge space, right? Now, I, I would of course like to, well, well what one would assume first of all that, that the space, the actual dimensionality of the space is, is much lower than that apparent dimensionality and if only because of autocorrelations, right? Because, you know, how lemony and how citrusy something smell will probably be one and the same, right? The, the, those are not really different entities. And so there are definitely autocorrelations here. And the underlying dimensionality is probably much lower than 146. And there are various statistical methods to exhume uh, actual uh, from apparent dimensionality from large data sets where the most hands-free, simplistic approach would be a method called PCA or principal components analysis. Now, in, in the sake of about three minutes or four minutes of our time, uh, how many people in the room have a profound, very good understanding of PCA? Please lift your hand. Okay, a certain amount. And how many people would be very happy if I spend three, four minutes telling them what PCA is? A good amount, great. So here comes our one slide course uh, of PCA, okay? Remember, I wanted to get the actual underlying dimensionality of this data set. Now, first I'll say in words what PCA does. This may, may be slightly obscure. Then, then I'll give you a, an anal analogy which should make it reasonably clear. So PCA takes your entire data cloud, right? In this case, again, 150 experts rating 138 orders on 146 descriptors, so lots of lots of data points, right? And basically rotates this cloud until it finds the best single line that you can pull through the cloud. That is the one line that explains the majority, the most of the variance that you can explain by one line through this data. And that, by definition, is PC1 or principal component number one. Okay? Then you go on rotating the cloud again until you find the line that best explains the remaining variance in the data. Uh, this is called PC2 or principal component number two, uh, which, because of the underlying assumptions of PCA, is by definition orthogonal uh, uh, to PC1. And you can go on doing this till you find a set of axes that explain the variance in your data, theoretically up to 146 in this data set if they were all totally independent, which is highly unlikely. Um, to give you a better sense of this, forget measuring odors and, and imagine I were physically measuring people in the room, okay? And forget 146 verbal descriptors. Let's imagine eight physical descriptors of people in the room, okay? So you have height, weight, shoe number, thinness, which may appear like an odd term, but soon you'll see why I use it. A thumb diameter, head circumference, nose length, and nostril diameter because we, we study smell. Now, once again, I would like to show you all the people in the room on an eight-dimensional graph. I cannot. So, so I will just choose uh, two of the uh, dimensions, uh, let's say height and weight. And, and a typical room uh, would look something uh, like this, right? Where, where this room may have some people who are, who, are, who are fairly happy people. He's not here, so can I afford uh, to do this? Uh, and, and, and fairly unhappy people. But as, <laughs> as, as a rule, as a rule, uh, a room would look like this. And, and it's fairly easy to sort of uh, uh, see what the line that explains the majority uh, uh, of the variance in the data here, uh, uh, this would be that line. Now, Pulling the line through the data then allows you to do various things that can be meaningful when you try to later understand your data. One thing you can do is you can ask to what extent each one of these descriptors weighted on the line or influenced the line, right? So, so you can end up with something like this where these are not typos, these bunches up here, right? Because indeed, if, if you're high up on this line, if you have a high PC1 value in this case, you'll have a lot of weight and a lot of height. So they'll be positively weighted on, on your PC1. But no, thinness is not unimportant. If you have a lot of thinness, you'll be negatively weighted on the line. Okay, so, so thinness is negatively weighted on PC1, right? Or you can think of PC1 here as some sort of line that goes from having a lot of thinness to having a lot of height and weight. Whereas all these others are bunched up in the middle. They're not really meaningless, meaningful, I'm sorry, for, 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 for this line. Now, so, so, so that's one nice thing that this can do for you is see how these things influence this. And, and often also you can give this, especially if this happens to explain a lot of the variance, you can give it a meaningful name in, in the world that we can think of. So for example, what would be something, uh, something that has a lot of weight and a lot of height, has a lot of what in one word? 
mass would be size perfect yeah so 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 size right so you can give a meaningful name in in this case to pc1 if you see how get something that goes from here to here that's that's size it doesn't always work but but often it works at, at the intuitive level so now forget all these measures again forget people in the room and forget these measures think of 150 odors 146 verbal descriptors this is the method we applied and this is the initial result we get okay and what you see here uh, so these are the first 10 principal components. In blue, you see the percent of the variance in that data explained by each one of the components. And in red, you see the cumulative variance by a number of PCs. And, and what you see here right off the bat is that indeed this is likely not 146 dimensional space, okay? Because PC1 of odor perception alone explains slightly less than 30% of the variance. Remember that number slightly less because I'm going to show you a strikingly similar graph later on, but you'll know it's different because it'll be slightly more. But <laughs> so this is slightly less than 30% of the variance for PC1. And you'll notice that four PCs alone explain well over half of the variance. Okay? So, so this is not 146 dimensional space, it's a space of some lower dimensionality. And now I can use this for something that's helpful. What I can do now is represent those 138 odorants not in 146 dimensional space. I'll choose a four dimensional space. Four because it's more than half of the variance. This is an arbitrary decision. Where each odor is now represented by four values. It's PC1, 2, 3, and 4 value. So I know this captures more than half of the variance. Now again, I'd like to show you a four dimensional graph. I cannot. So I will show you a two dimensional graph. Here's PC1. Here's PC2. And here are 138 odorants represented in this space. And I'm allowing myself to call this now a meaningful perceptual odor space. Now that's already making a claim. If this is an understanding question, I'll address it now. If it's a general question, I'll let's do it a bit later, just because I want to capture some, some ground. So, so th these are 138 odorants represented in, in olfactory perceptual space. Uh, I'm already making a claim here. And, and if you want to make a claim, you have to, to, to validate it. And, and one underlying assumption of this claim that, that can be validated is if this is a valid perceptual space, that would imply that odors that are close together here should smell similar to each other, and odors that are far apart here should be dissimilar uh, from one another. So uh, we uh, pseudo-randomly selected nine odorants that span the space. Then you can just measure the pairwise Euclidean distance between uh, these odor pairs. And then we brought in subjects to the lab, presented them with these pairs of odors where, uh, from an olfactometer, where every time after they smell the two, they have to cross a line anywhere between extremely different to identical. Right? So it's a fair prediction. We predict that odors that are close in our space will smell similar, and odors that are far in our space will smell uh, dissimilar. And here's the result. This is 30 individuals, where each point is a pairwise odor comparison. And here you have the PCA-based distance and the actual uh, rated similarity. And uh, as you can see, this is quite straightforward. Odors that are close in the space smell similar. Odors that are far in the space smell dissimilar. Uh, so, 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 so in this sense, uh, the space is perceptually valid. Now, remember in our sort of brief uh, PCA course, we said one thing that's cool is that you can sometimes understand the nature of PC1 at least by observing how the various descriptors weighted on it, okay? What, what were its two ends? And, and sometimes you can give that a, a, a nice meaning. So, of course, it would be nice to name PC1. So let's see, let's see what its two ends uh, were. And as you can see, PC1 ranged on the positively weighted end from sweet, perfumey, aromatic, floral, and light. In the negatively weighted end, it had Sweaty, sharp, pungent, acid, rancid, putrid, foul, decayed, and sickening. Okay, quite straightforward. Again, I will ask you for one word that describes things that are uh, floral and perfumey at one end, or putrid, foul, decayed, and sickening at the other. Pleasantness. Thank you. So, so, uh, so, so, uh, outer pleasantness would seem to be a good word, and pleasantness here in the notion of ranging from very unpleasant to very pleasant. Uh, to this uh, primary dimension of human olfactory perception. Uh, once again, intuition is nice, but not enough. So uh, we repeated an experiment where now we have rating of pleasantness from extremely pleasant to extremely unpleasant. Um, and here you have the weighting of that on PC1. Okay, PC1 of the perceptual data is pleasantness. This has been, since been replicated by, by many. 
um, and, and this, this is a robust uh, uh, finding. So to quickly reiter reiterate what we've done in perception, uh, we've taken this old perceptual data to try and uh, reduce uh, its apparent dimensionality and find the axes of perception that, that shape this space. And we've tested the validity of those axes as an axis for, for a spatial organization of voters. Uh, what's slightly cool about this is note that the tests we did are in subjects mostly in a different country 30 years after the original data was collected, right? So, so th this retained validity across those distances, that's kind of nice. In turn, I'll point out that we've not really discovered anything new here. I'll, I'll just share this with you. Uh, so the notion that pleasantness is the primary dimension of human olfactory perceptual space or perception has been long known. And if to attribute it to anyone, then I'll attribute it to Susan Schiffman and her colleagues working in the 70s. So this is not novel in that sense. It, it's a, a rediscovery of something known previously where the nice thing about it is, is that unlike other methods that were used before, PCA, uh, although one can discuss its disadvantages, an advantage is that it's hands off, right? So I don't, don't, didn't introduce priors to the data. I didn't select weightings. This is the story the data tells us. And, and that's a nice aspect. But to, to sum up where we're standing on order perception, we have a perceptual space. We've identified its primary access. So we can at least do something meaningful in this respect. Yes. Yeah, so of course, there's, there are two selection questions here, right? The descriptors and the odorants. Uh, I'm, I'm large, well, I, I should be careful. I'm, I'm reasonably confident that it's not extremely dependent on the selection of, of the odorants because within this data set, and that's in this paper, we did subsets of the data that were randomly selected in various ways. It comes out the same thing. But more importantly, we've since done huge amounts of data, and others have as well. And um, it, it always turns out this way, right? So we have this now on 1,500 molecules instead of, of uh, 138. Uh, others have done it on different sets of molecules. Now, you might, of course, say, OK, it's the set of molecules that exist in olfaction research. Granted, right? So, so, so the extent where I can tell you it's not dependent on it is that it's worked on much larger data sets. And it works on, on cutting of those data sets randomly and arbitrarily, uh, which is all I can do. Right, I, I, and so to the extent that we can address the question, we've addressed it. But I agree with you that this can, you know, maybe if you'll bring a selection of odorant from Mars, uh, this might fall apart or descriptors. But uh, we'll, we'll get to that again. Only if these are fundamental understanding questions, because otherwise, you know, for debate questions, if I can delay you a bit. But yeah, so with that in mind. But again, that would be that would be addressed by by uh, the things we have done and shown of, of you know randomly splitting your descriptor set and all this. You always end up with this PC one. I mean, it's it's the same PC one again and again and again, no matter what you do with the descriptors or with the odors. Well, OK, I, I see where, so in a way, I think where this presentation is going will sort of address that in a fundamental way. Because I think this is, an, I, I don't think this is related to humans. I think it's related to the structure of the world. Right. MDS? No, but MDS, you, you're, you're going to select weights. You could, in, in any case, I should say, uh, you know, again, this is going to the discussion that I'd really prefer to have at the end. But, but I will say one word because it's also meaningful, and this is reiterating uh, a point made by Aaron Ravia from from our lab. We will see his work soon. Is that we, we've we've over time tested and retested this using really fancy nonlinear methods and etc. 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 Any you know, name your flavor of the month, right? You know, uh, Bayesian statistics, whatever you know, whatever works that month, right? 
nothing works better than the simple linear approach, which is interesting about the system, right? I mean, you know, you, but this is, again, let's leave this for, 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 for later on. Uh, so, so we've said something about perception. Now let's see if we can, we can relate it um, um, in, 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 to some extent uh, uh, to neural structure and then to, 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 to neural responses and to structure. And, and the neural part here, I'm just going to do really, I'm not going to go into this in depth in this presentation. I'm, I'm going to concentrate on this link, structure to perception. I'm just parking here for a second on the neural, just to, to amuse you and share with you a bit of, of the things we do. Uh, and, and so humans, as you know already from this uh, um, meeting, I don't have to go into detail, have a full-blown uh, olfactory system. We've seen beautiful work on their olfactory uh, uh, bulbs right here. They have an olfactory epithelium with about six million uh, ORNs in it probably, uh, and, and, and a an full-blown olfactory system in their brain. And for us, this is a unique opportunity. For those of us who study humans, this is a unique opportunity because these neurons, these OSNs, in fact, have their, their uh, endings uh, outside of the skull, right, in the nose, where we can reach. So we do that. And here you have one of our happy participants. Um, we invest a lot in developing non-invasive stereotactic devices. This is our generation two or somewhere generation five right now, so it doesn't look like this anymore. Uh, it looks worse. Uh, but but key, things, key things to see here uh, are the odor line uh, entering the nose right here, uh, and this is an LFP electrode going here, right? And, and so how does it look when you go there? Um, this, I think, is my nose, although I'm not sure. Uh, so we have a fiber optic on this as well. Uh, that's one of, one of the nice things. We were talking about this before about mice. So uh, uh, humans have a big nose, uh, and, and, and you can put in a fiber optic with your, with your electrode. Uh, this is the middle nasal turbinate, which already has receptors on it. And, and this is our electrode arriving uh, this is about, just to give you an idea, this is about 270 uh, microns across on the electrode. So, you know, in, in, in the world, most of the rodent people live here. This is an utterly crude recording device. In the world of measuring human neurons, this is, you know, for us, this is the best that it gets, right? Because we're recording uh, an LFP uh, in a live behaving human here, um, as you will soon see. Here we've gone all the way up to the cribriform plate. So this right here, basically your brain is two millimeters from here, two, three millimeters from here. This is the thinnest part of your skull. Um, and, and we're parked here right at the cribriform plate uh, with the recording electrode. Uh, to wake everybody up, because it's in the early phase, I'll share with you an amusing uh, um, historical <laughs> thing that happened to us. So we, 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 we presented this project uh, in, in front of the, um, we, we were asked to present it in front of the political uh, sort of gathering of the European Union. This is because it, this was funded by the by the uh, by NERC, and they selected it as, as a flagship, not because of the science, right, but because this led to this project uh, that that involved uh, assisting disabled individuals. So they they were happy to sort of show it off, and they asked us to come to the political meeting, which that year happened to be held in in Austria. Um, and, and so I'm standing right in, in a room full of like 3,000 suits, basically, right? Including, you know, heads of states, foreign ministers, uh, uh, you name it, um, in, in, uh, in Austria. And, and one of the graduate students in our lab, Offer Prol, uh, uh, equipped me uh, with a video to add to my talk where, where, where when I reached showing this, I said that uh, our approach to entering the nose was inspired uh, by an Austrian Renaissance man. Uh, and uh, I showed this. <laughs> <laughs> what happened is that nobody in the room even smiled, right? Because, because apparently uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a sensitive issue in Austria. I was not fully aware of this. <laughs> and and, and you know, the talk sort of recovered after that, but, but this was a, a touchy moment. Uh, but now back to, to real videos. So, so here you have... Uh, these frames are video as well, and they're here just to, to portray the that this person is not really moving. No, and, and you're hearing those words in Hebrew. Uh, Shifa. And, and the critical it's point here, are, this is the odor line, it and this is the, the electrode line. Um, and what you see here, here's the odor, and here's the, the, the drop, uh, and the negative deflection uh, in, in the intranasal electrode. Where on one hand, you can look at it as a die, you know, there's nothing very exciting here, but on the other hand, this is, this is recording a neural response in a behaving human who gives you behavior in real time, right? There, there is no equivalent of that that I know of, 
right? I mean, so, so from that aspect, it's cool. And as I said, I won't go into the depth of, of this part of our work. It, it would be a total separate talk, but I'll say in one word, remember that our, our, our uh, uh, primary perceptual uh, access is pleasantness. Uh, we tried any way we could to explain the neural recordings with something meaningful in terms of odor. And the best explanation we could found uh, was a fitting uh, to odor pleasantness. So this, each point here is a comparison of two odors. This is their difference in pleasantness versus their difference in response we measure in the nose. And it's the best explanation we found of the various explanations uh, we tried. Again, not explaining an overwhelming portion of the variance, but on the other hand, very real. So there's something in there uh, uh, that's being uh, picked up. We have the so if you give. You, you give, so you're giving lots of odors here in succession, right? And, and each odor gives you a different EOG response, and you're trying to understand, explain those differences in response. So you can look at every pair of odors you, you can compare there and ask, okay, what's the difference between those odors that best correlates with the difference between the responses? Okay? So, with me, so. It is judged by the subjects. So it depends on which study. Here, pleasantness was judged, I think, uh, later or before, not during. Uh, but, but it is judged by the same subjects. So of the, of the things we have, like intensity, like pleasantness, like familiarity, like structure that we tried all sorts of things, the one best line that we could find to explain those differences was odor pleasantness. Now, this does imply right, that, that in a way you could think of the epithelium as, as patchy along a line of pleasantness. But again, this is going into a, a study that I really didn't want to spend time on here. So, so um, gave it two different uh, 18 different orders. Sometimes, yes, okay. but, but not what but you. really, you were looking at the response. Yes. And if they were weighted in a separate study, they more or less. I, I, I wouldn't say a different study because it's the same subjects, right? And, and, and the differences in pleasantness are not that big across subjects. But it's the same subjects. So the same individuals, right, rated the pleasantness of the odor, not while you were seeing this being recorded, but shortly thereafter or shortly before. And the difference in response was correlated with the difference in pleasantness. To a, to a degree, I mean, you saw it's not a correlation of one. But. No, you rate how pleasant it is on a scale from 0 to 100. It's a difference. So, so, you, 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 so this, is an, uh, this is an area under the curve measure, right? So, so you have uh, uh, this evoked response, which is a few thousand receptors together, probably. And you have an area under the curve, right? So you have area under curve for odor A, area under curve for odor B, on to 16 or 18, OK? So you have 18 areas under the curve. For each two orders, there's a difference in the area under the curve. And there's that difference versus the difference in pleasantness is, is correlated. Which again, does mean, again, we're, we're parking in, at the wrong place. But that, but, so, so I, I, let's go back to this later, yeah. I'm sorry? Of course not, yeah, sadly. So, right, so, th so this, again, I'm desperately not wanting to talk about this study at length, but because, because I really want to reach new stuff. But, but uh, uh, in a word, right, so th there's a question, which in a way is what this study tested. There's an underlying assumption of whether the receptor subtypes are randomly and uniformly distributed. If they're randomly and uniformly distributed, you're right. If they're patchy, you're wrong. Our data suggests, therefore, that they're patchy. But this is really where we're not. You know, let, let me, because I'm way behind. I want to talk about new stuff, and, and this is all published stuff you know, to the extreme. So, so let, let me try and move ahead. So, so to reiterate where we're standing, we, we've measured perception, and, and, and we came up with this notion of some primary dimension. I'm not going to claim much about what we've done here. I'm just saying that it seems like 
at some level, this primary dimension is reflected at the earliest stage of neural responses. Reflected is all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's, you know, I'm not saying more than that. But now let's see if we can re relate all this to odor structure, uh, where once again, how do you measure odor structure? We have chemists for this. Chemists have come up with, with uh, basic measures, let's say, that even I understand. And, and they've come up with way more complex measures that probably nobody in the room understands. And, and um, luckily for that, uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, identified a software called Dragon. Uh, I think that if we'll end up having any contribution to the field of, of olfaction at the end of the day uh, from our lab, it'll be that we brought Dragon into the world of olfaction. I think that's the only maybe valuable thing at the end, but they, and, and they're happy. They're, they're Italian, by the way, and they're really nice if you communicate with them. Uh, and and um, so Dragon is a software that you can plug in any molecule, and it spits back at you a bunch of, of uh, physical chemical descriptors. Uh, the work I'm showing you here is with V2 of Dragon, which was 1,664 descriptors per molecule. Current Dragon is about 7,000 descriptors per mo molecule. Uh, for those that wonder, it makes no difference what you use in terms of what I am going to show you. So now, once again, we have a very potentially high dimensional space of odor structure, right? We have molecules with potentially 1,664 dimensions to them. Uh, and since our lab is a one-trick pony at this stage, uh, we said, okay, let's see if we can reduce this apparent dimensionality to some more meaningful actual dimensionality. So we applied PCA <coughs> to this data. Now. Some PCA aficionados in the room, which I know of at least a few, might argue that you could not apply a potentially 1,664 dimensional world to 138 potential data points. And with that in mind, we mined 1,500 odorants at this stage, which we applied the analysis to. And here you see the initial result. And remember, I told you there would be a strikingly similar graph, but it's not a copy. So here you go. Uh, here are the first 10 PCs of odor structure. And you will notice that PC1 of structure explains, in fact, slightly more than 30% of the variance. And once again, four PCs of structure explain well over half of the variance in the structural data. Uh, with that in mind, we can play the same set of games. Namely, we can represent our data in reduced dimensionality space. So here are 1,500 odors in PC1 and PC2 of structure. And of course, we can ask ourselves the enticing question, what is PC1 of structure. And, and again, the intuitive way of doing that is looking at the descriptors that flanked both ends. So let's look at the descriptors. And I'm sure everybody in the room will jump with intuitive in understanding of a uh, PC that ranges from something like average eigenvector coefficient sum from electronegativity weighted distance matrix at one end, that's one descriptor, right? To the sum of the atomic von der Waal volumes, which may be slightly more meaningful to some of us at the other end, right? You know, obviously, uh, you know, I don't know, there may be some people in the room that this speaks to in any way. Uh, we did not claim that we were one of those people. Um, now, with that in mind, uh, in collaboration with chemists, uh, real chemists, we've, we've recently actually sort of selected a name uh, for this. So, so this is actually not, there's actually text underlying this, this black outline. But, but I outline, I, 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 I erased it here for, for a reason. And, and the reason being is that the name, the one word name we gave to this chemical entity is arguable and, and, uh, and poorly argued by me, right? Because I'm not, not a chemist. So to not put myself in that perilous position, uh, what I will continue doing here is referring to this axis as PC1 of structure, which is a, st a statistical statement and, and not a chemical statement, okay? Which I can sort of stand by, yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I, I don't think, I know. <laughs> We've done it. We've done it. You know, sometimes one will switch. Even if you do it again on the same set, as you know, you won't always get the same thing, right? But but the, more or less the same set. You get the same PC1. So if you use a different set of odorants, then the correlation between PC1 and PC1 values is like 0.96, like things like that. It's the same. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, okay, I'll say it once, and, and but then don't ask me questions about it now. Uh, the term that's underlying there is, is compactness. And it's something that captures both the size and the, the, how dense the, the molecules are. I think where things that are more compact are less pleasant. But you know, I, I'm not in the position to defend that in, in any meaningful way. 
um, but it's compactness. So, oh. <coughs> perfect. Thank you. Thank you for uh, in, in Hebrew. There's a, there's a term. I, I don't. It doesn't. It doesn't have a good translation. La rim lan chata. That when when you lift for somebody for a serve, right? So thank you for lifting for for the serve. Um, we, we've done these things independently, right? We've looked at we looked at at uh, the structure of perceptual space. We looked at the structure of of structural space. There's nothing since we've done this independently. There's nothing to prevent us from asking whether these axes are in any way related. Right? And this brings me to, to, to the result that, for, for me, till this day, remains, from my humble point of view, the most you know, interesting result in this entire story. And, and, and as I've pointed out, it's kind of sad that the most exciting moment in one's life is captured by this boring black and white graph. So, so to try and give it some, some life, uh, I'll add color. Um, and, and here's what you're seeing. You're seeing the independent correlelograms between perceptual PC1, PC2, PC3, PC4, and onto potentially 146, right? And each one of the structural PCs, PC1, 2, 3, 4, 5, onto potentially 1,664. And one correlation statistically stood out. And that was the correlation between the primary percep perceptual dimension and the primary structural dimension, right? Again, not explaining an insanely huge amount of the variance, but statistically, significantly different from any other correlation uh, obtained in this data with any uh, severity of statistical test you want to ask if, if this is really different from the others. It is. Now, what, why, why am I saying you know, that I think this is meaningful? What does this mean? This means that this notion of, of, of odor pleasantness, that at least I told we did this work, I thought that it was entirely subjective. I thought that it's merely reflection of, you know, of our culture, of what our mother made us for breakfast, of our first love, you name it, right? This means no. This means that that thing we call pleasantness is written into the, the molecular structure, right? That, it's, that it's, a, it's a descriptor of the natural world. It's how the world is organized, right? PC1 of structure is the axis that explains the structural variance in the set of molecules. PC1 of perception is the axis that explains our primary perceptual space, and they're linked, which in, in a way is unsurprising, right? It means we've evolved to extract the most meaningful axis in the world around us, and we happen to call it pleasantness. It could be your mice call it something else. That doesn't matter. We, we predict it would be the same axis, only with a different name, right, more or less. Now, that, that, of course, is a strong statement, and, and, and it's a statement that can be tested. Because what this means is that, that we think we can predict pleasantness from structure, and moreover, that the, the prediction would, would survive uh, uh, across uh, cultures. And, and I will share with you that you know, this is already a summation of lots of data uh, published in separate studies, where basically what you see here uh, on, on the x-axis is our physical chemical axis which is made, I should say, not only of PC1, but it's a PC-based access. Uh, and this is the rated pleasantness. And this is the typical correlations we obtain. So we can now, uh, and we've done this across three cultures so far, um, no difference. Um, and, and, and one of them, at least, incredibly uh, you know, way out. So we've done this on native Ethiopians uh, way off, right, culturally, and, and, and uh, the same thing. Actually, you can say almost in a word for cultures. I'm counting Americans and Israelis as the same, which is, I'm, uh, I won't go there. So, we, yeah, we, so, 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 uh, so, 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 you know, we can, we can very significantly explain a reason, reasonable proportion of, of the variance in, in odor pleasantness um, using this approach. Now, remember, I'll bring us back to where we set out to go. Right, where this entire thing is to answer that challenge by, by uh, 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 um, uh, what's his name for the uh, audition? Uh, Bell, right? That can we compare uh, uh, roses, violet, and, and asafetida? And as has been pointed out here uh, uh, several times throughout this meeting, up till now I've been uh, working here with monomolecules. The real world is not monomolecules. Rose, violin, and asafetida are not monomolecules, right? I would like to say, okay, since we know from other work that, that when humans rate the, the, the similarity of odorants, they're really relying to a large part on the, the pleasantness similarity. I could say, okay, let's use this as a similarity metric and, and predict how similar rose, violin, and asafetida are. But, but they're mixtures, and these are monomolecules. So, so we need to go to the world of mixtures. 
and, and this is work now uh, um, led by, by Kobe Snitz, who's, who's here in the room, uh, where, where we ask ourselves, OK, can we, how can we use this, this metric that we have from monomolecules to understand the behavior of mixtures? Where, in, in general, you can think of two approaches, right? One would be that, let's say we have one mixture made of these two molecules and one mixture made of these three molecules, and we wanted to compare them. You could think of taking this pleasantness metric, doing all the pairwise comparisons between each two possible molecules in the mixtures, however many you may have, and somehow summing that um, and reaching some sort of measure. Or alternatively, you can think of not doing this pairwise approach, but rather first treating each mixture, uh, uh, generating one vector of its pleasantnesses, right, and, and, and then representing it as, as one vector, and then the other mixture is another vector, and then somehow measuring the relation between the two vectors, for example, the angle between them, what I'll refer to as the angle distance metric. So you can think of these two alternatives, uh, and for the sake of time, I will share with you that this alternative, and, and not go through all the results, that, that this alternative fails completely, fails completely, uh, and this alternative uh, works powerfully. Um, yeah. I don't really know how to how to answer a question of is it just obvious, uh, but yeah. <laughs> it wasn't obvious to us. Uh, and and hey guys, I have I have nine minutes to go through a ton of data, so I, right? So so I'm just going to say that that. Uh, this works uh, really powerfully. And, and here you have what we now call the optimized angle distance metric. Uh, here you have our predicted similarity. Here you have the rated similarity, where each point here is a comparison between two odorant mixtures that range in their size from 2 to 40 molecules. And, and this works really, really well. Okay? You would say, OK, we can now go and answer Bell's question. But wait, there's more. <laughs> because here, there was one condition in the development of this algorithm. And that is that when we made these mixtures, we first equated the perceived intensity of all components. So we made all components equally intense because intensity adds a bunch of problems. In the real world, that's also not the case. You have mixtures, and the components are at different intensities in the, com in, in the mixture. So we set out to solve that problem. Um, where first we ask, OK, what happens if you apply this, this existing algorithm to mixtures where the components are not of equated intensity? They're natural mixtures. Um, and here's the one example of a result. There's lots of data you're looking at here that will soon be publicly available. Uh, again, each point is a mixture uh, rated by around 25 people. And you can see uh, that sometimes this algorithm works pretty well for real mixtures that were not equated for perceived intensity. Right? I mean, this is pretty good. We're, we're happy with this. Um, but sometimes uh, it works less good. This is another set of mixtures. And, and sometimes it works less good. Right? It's, still, it's still statistically significant. There's lots of data here. But this is not already as impressive in predicting the actual similarity of these mixtures. So to address that, uh, what Aaron has now done um, is added an intensity uh, um, sort of measure for each component in the mixture. Where you can do this in two ways, you can either try and predict the intensity of the component by its structure alone, or actually measure it with people. So what we call the expensive and the cheap way. Uh, and I'm going to show you the, only the result of the, the expensive way or, or the less effective way in the long term. But basically, what we do here is we first have individual subjects rate the intensity of each component of each mixture. And we add that as, as a component in, in what's now the modified algorithm. Uh, and here, you have the result on that same data. So we, we recover this now. So we can now really do this for natural mixtures, okay? that have different components with different intensities. We can predict their similarity. This brings us full circle to the question we set out to ask. Using the now modified snitz ravia algorithm, uh, here are the predicted uh, differences uh, between rose violet, violet asafetida, and rose asafetida. Okay? So this is the prediction. Um, and here's the result. Okay? So I think, you know, I think it's fair for us to say that we've answered uh, the, the challenge, right? So we, we can now uh, predict 
the perceptual similarity of rose violet and asafoetida. Um, what is the implication of all, or what could be the implications for all this? Uh, given uh, the restricted time left, I'm I'm going to actually so so I'm I'm going to thank Leslie for for presenting olfactory white because that's going to save me. I'm not going to go into it. I'm just going to say in one. I'll, I'll just give the introduction to this that one potential outcome, right, is that now that we have a metric, a, a, a continuous metric to, to, to measure uh, six, <laughs> a, continuous, a continuous metric uh, uh, to measure uh, a smell, uh, since in, in the world of color vision, at least, if, if you make a mixture where you span the continuous metric, or an audition where you span the continuous metric, it doesn't matter what you put into your span. As long as you've spanned, you end up with the same percept called white light or white noise, we predicted that if we span the perceptual space in olfaction, uh, even though we use mixtures with no overlapping components, they should smell, we predicted identical. They don't smell identical. They smell highly, highly similar. Uh, we call this olfactory white. Even though I'm terribly running out of time, I still have to tell you this one amusing story because it's the only thing you'll probably remember uh, from this talk. When we ran the experiments on olfactory white, so we gave subjects this novel odorant. We, we said, let's give it a name. We'll give it some name that sounds like a French perfume or something. We called it Laurent, after Gilles Laurent, right? And, and, <laughs> and so what subjects actually did was study Laurent. But then when com the paper was accepted for publication, and I said, oh, I shouldn't get in trouble, I emailed Gilles. And I said, look, Gilles, we have this paper coming out with a novel order we've invented. We called it Laurent. Is that cool with you? And Gilles answered back and said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? Come on, I'd, I'd love it if somebody would call an order after me. Don't be so, you know? No. And I, and I emailed him pressing again. I said, come on, what do you care? And he said, no, call it Axel. <laughs> so, so he did. So, so Lorax. Lorax is Laurent <laughs> Axel, so either we insult nobody or we insult everybody equally. I mean, you can choose it. Not, so, but that's the I mean, it's the only thing you'll remember. But that's that's the name. Of, that's the source of the name Lorax, and not Dr. Seuss, as what everybody else thought that is where we brought it from. Uh, and indeed, I, I, again, for the sake of time, uh, I, I'll just point out that these these com these mixtures end up uh, uh, we, uh, 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 really smelling similar. Now, because this took longer than intended. Um, all the really interesting stuff is basically going to be in uh, four minutes. But here is our algorithm applied uh, to Leslie's data. Okay, So this is what she presented previously as her triangle test. Uh, and here is our similarity algorithm, uh, the distance angle uh, metric applied to her data, and explains it kind of nicely. And it also uncovers um, a, a phenomenon. And, and that is that you'll notice that there's this, there's this lower boundary. Uh, to this. There's a lower boundary, or in other words, there's some sort of angle distance metric, right? Some sort of measure in our world of angle distance metric, where given some variance around it, this is the border of discrimination in human olfaction. Okay? Or what's referred to in, in, in psychophysics in, in the world of sensory systems, this is the just noticeable difference. Okay? So this is the J and D of olfaction in the angle distance metric. Now, um, <clears throat> on this data, it, it, it's somewhere at this range of, 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 of angle distance metric. But this data was not collected in order to find this, right? And in order to really find this, you need a lot more mixtures right around this number. So we've now conducted an insane amount of work. Uh, each dot here is a full study uh, of <clears throat> a comparison of two mixtures. You have 100 different mixtures here, rated each one by 25 subjects. Where this is the the uh, angle, this is the the result of the triangle test, and this is the angle distance uh, in in radians, and um, this is the data where you can see it, it, it summed together. It really seems to fit a nice uh, psychophysical uh, uh, function uh, without any fitting, um, and and we're currently claiming that the J and D is somewhere around 0.05 uh, 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 radians in angle distance metric. So so this is uh, the J and D. What can we do with the J and D? I will tell you in two minutes. Um, and and uh, to smell the result, uh, maybe we'll, we'll be able to in a second. So what can we do with J and D? <clears throat> Here you have a bunch of 128 odors. Uh, and, and I'll just point out, we've now already done this with 2,700. But I'm going to show you the results with 128, because that's what I have in the slides. That basically span um, odor space. Now. You can take these 128 molecules here and make any possible mixture 
that you could make ranging in size from two to 45 molecules. Now it's not really any because anybody who can quickly do math in their head will say that you know the Weizmann supercomputer will spend the next 10 years on doing that. Uh, so so we, we sort of jump the spaces, but this is using Weizmann you know really powerful computers. Uh, so it's lots, not all, uh, of the mixtures, right? And so you can end up with this huge amount of potential odor mixtures from all these molecules. But then we apply the J and D to it, and we ask, okay, leave only those that are discriminable from all others, okay? Only those that are discriminable from all others using our J and D metric. And this should be the odors that humans can smell. Now, this has a ton of implications, which are in the next 30 slides that I have 22 seconds to show you. So I will not. I will just say in words what they mean, right? One thing that this means is that you could potentially take the perimeter of this, and the size of the perimeter depends on how you want to define your J and D, and mix the perimeter to get any result in the middle. Right? This means that you can choose odors from around here and mix them to generate any other odor. Okay? Or in other words, you'll have a set of odor primaries that you can build any odor in the world with, and they'll be indiscriminable by J and D. To do that, we, we, we worked together with Christophe Ludamiel, a perfumer known to many here. He made for us now a set of odors of, of he chose whatever he wanted out of the 2,700 uh, source molecules. And we're now recreating the same odors using none of the molecules he's using. Okay? And what you have here is a Christophe rose and rose of ours uh, that are, are designed to smell the same, although they, they're not. And, and although there's one glitch here of one component that I'll, uh, we can talk about if we get to it. So, so A, you have a set of primaries that can make any perceivable odor. B, this uh, sets a prediction on how many discriminable odors there are, a, a question that's been uh, a, a major source of interest in our field. And C, uh, this predicts how many perceptual dimensions uh, the system should really have. So, so with some notion of risk, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the numbers that we apply to this right now. And I'm doing this, this is a bit risky behavior on my side because by the time this is the paper, these numbers can change, but they won't change you know, by, by uh, orders of magnitude, I hope. <laughs> so, so we're predicting that, that uh, uh, this, this, this model implies that humans can discriminate about 20 million orders, uh, that we need 200 or less primaries to generate any perceivable order that you have, uh, and that the dimensions of human olfactory perceptual space are about six. I'm going to end with that because of, even though I wanted to show you more stuff, uh, and uh, but I still must uh, uh, thank uh, the people who, who, who were the heavy lifters in this project. And, and I'll start off with historically, uh, uh, Rehan Khan, uh, Rafi Haddad, who's here in the room, uh, Haddad Lapid and Adia Blanca generated important aspects to this sort of tale. And currently, the people who are carrying the load are Kobe Sneets and Aaron Ravia, both of them in the room, both of them way better equipped than I to answering hard questions. Uh, and, and finally, our, our funding, which is primarily European, uh, both Horizon 2020 and uh, ERC Advanced, carrying major par portions of this load, uh, including some additional uh, funders. And finally, thank you very much for your attention. I know this has been dense. <laughs>